Mutant Chronicles, Fiction, The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy, Volume 3, Dementia, by Michael A. Stackpole. Chapter 1 I didn't attend my funeral, but I've seen a video a number of times. My corporate masters at Cybertronic had thoughtfully edited out any clues of my identity. But that wasn't hard, because most folks at the funeral don't speak the name of the dead. Those who eulogized me just used impersonal pronouns to refer to me, which was fine, because to them, I was no longer a person. Not so to Cybertronic. After someone had snapped my spine in two and had driven a chunk of my skull into my brain, they saw me as corporate material. Apparently, blunt instrument trauma made one a very attractive candidate for employment because they spent a lot of money to get me ready to enter the field again, as career opportunities for dead men usually involve vivisection, being pieced out for parts, or sating unnatural desires. I opted for service with Cybertronic. The flat, matte black of my little lozenge-shaped ash coffin reminded me of a suppository. And down here, in dusty dark, Torcelli tray looked like where they might have shoved it. Capital is usually a bit better at keeping areas under its corporate sway cleaner, but the multi-level development in what had once been the Torcelli crater, in the southeast quadrant of the moon's visible face, was old and had long since decayed. Down here, the thick moisture-laden air leached heat from my body and promoted the growth of more molds than I have any desire to know about. The computer mounted inside my skull, taking up the room available through the removal of damaged brain tissue, used my olfactory nerve to sample the air. The fiber optic cable that ran along my optic nerve and into my eyeballs displayed information on a spot that appeared to be toward the lower portion of my visual window, as if I were wearing bifocal glasses to read fine print. In glowing green letters, it scrolled out the names of all the things it had detected. It also declared that only Cladiosporia lunaria was in a dangerous concentration and that it had already begun to inhibit my body's histamine production. That was the least of what the computers and the million or so terabytes of information could do. As usual, I ignored it and concentrated on my mission. After all, had there been something that a computer alone could have handled, Cybertronic would have sent an Attila unit out to complete it. The operation, my brief had said, required discretion, and no Attila had ever been described as discreet. Wearing clothes that had stains on them older than I, I ducked into an alley and walked along it until the computer told me I was exactly 22.341 meters from the street. I scraped away the rubbish and debris, then slumped down. I pressed my back to the wall of a cinder block building, aged to look older than lunar bedrock. I felt a flush come over me as the computer ordered capillary dilation and picked my heart rate up a bit. It's equivalent of keeping my engine revving in case I required quick action. First, I had to set the scene, so I would go unnoticed. Dressed as I was, and as far from the dark street as I had come, chances were I had not been seen at all by most folks. Those who did notice me would likely figure me a duster, someone who lived on the streets long enough that lunar dust covered them like a second skin. Most dusters have a substance abuse problem or live in alternate realities, so they have nothing worth stealing and therefore are left alone. Being left alone was what I wanted. My covert entry into the building behind me would not be particularly difficult, but would require time. During that time, my attention would be focused elsewhere, which meant my body would be very vulnerable. Having died once already, I really had no desire to do it again. Capital, like Bauhaus, Imperial, and Mishima, had become paranoid about certain aspects of technology. When the Dark Legion began to muck around in the affairs of men, they had good reasons for their concern, 
because the Dark Legion had the ability to warp humanity and technology to their own purposes. As a result, those corporations sanitized and isolated as much of their high-tech equipment in simple safe houses like the building I leaned back against. This meant yanking out and discarding anything more complicated than a hot plate or telephone. In their frenzy to clean things up, they relied heavily on experts who, because of ignorance or hefty bribes from Cybertronic, considered the optic cables and wires that had once connected the machinery utterly harmless. They plugged blocking plates into the old outlets and declared everything safe. But safe is a relative term. The truth of that concept proved itself quickly to me as I heard the clop of booted feet in the alley. With my arms hugged around my knees, I let my head tip back. I opened my mouth and kept my eyes closed, presenting the very picture of someone who had fallen asleep. I even gurgled and snorted a bit as the computer, using Doppler echo algorithms, counted down the meters until the pair of individuals reached me. Closing my eyes did severely limit my visual input concerning the two people coming toward me. Infrared sensors that had been inserted subdermally in my eyelids did provide me with a wealth of information that the computer digested in nanoseconds and delivered to me in a palatable form. It expanded its data feed, letting the images play across what normally would have been my field of vision so the yellow, red, and blue outlines occupied the same space the actual bodies would have taken up had my eyes been open. She was taller than he was, but more nervous, which meant I would take her second if I had to. They still could pass me by, saving us a whole lot of trouble. Hey Holt, it's just a kid, leave him. I liked her voice, because it didn't betray her nervousness, and even had a bit of compassion in it. Might have been maternal instinct, and mothering is nice. Standing practically on top of me, meant the computer drew her in a crisp rainbow that reminded me of old Warhol prints of Marilyn Monroe. And that meant I'd forgive this woman being taller than me. Holt, on the other hand, leaned down and got his face right in mine. About the same time the slender man realized he wasn't smelling flop sweat or narc sick from me, he started to finger something at his right hip. Neither the computer nor I figured out what he was doing as his body blocked our line of sight, so I had to act. When Cybertronic made me over in their own image, they changed quite a bit about me. The alterations went deeper than cosmetic changes to my face. Cybertronic, Cybertronic, trimmed an inch off all my long bones, then reinforced the shortened bones with carbon fibers. The slack that procedure created in my muscles allowed them to reattach the muscles closer to the middle of the bone, as the woman discovered when my left leg snapped out and crushed her ankle. The shift in muscles gave me far more leverage and made me hit much harder than anyone would have expected. Remaining in IR mode with my eyes closed, my right hand pulled a thin knife from the sheath of my right calf. I stabbed upward. I caught Holt right below the sternum, then slashed down and back. A reddish-orange line appeared on the lower half of his torso, then a flood of molten gold poured down over the knife and my hand. A quick shove sent Holt flying across the alley and bouncing off the far wall. I stood and backhanded the kneeling woman. Something cracked in her face, and she went down hard. The IR images dissolved as I opened my eyes. The computer started to exert some control on my autonomic nerves to slow my heartbeat, but I countermanded those directions. I wanted the elevated heartbeat and hypersenses the adrenaline rush gave me. It might hamper the latter part of my mission, but I wanted to be able to react quickly if a new threat presented itself. I grabbed her by her unbroken ankle and dragged her deeper into the alley. Hoisting her up, I heaved her body into a battered old dumpster. Returning to Holt, I cleaned my knife on the leg of my pants, then I stripped from him the pistol he had been going for when I killed him. I popped the clip from the iron fist and cleared the chamber. I tucked the ammo in my pocket 
then tossed his body and the pistol into the dumpster. As I walked back to my chosen position, the computer opened a cellular link into the comnet. After a couple of rings, a deadpan voice answered, Tranquility pre-owned furnishings. Though I didn't recognize the voice, I did catch the flat delivery, marking the speaker as a Cybertronic vacationer, which meant I had the right place. I have a pickup, two pieces in a dumpster, Tricelli tray, priority pickup requested, credit account RKX 571127. I listened long enough to get a confirmation, then cut the vac off when he started to describe the specials they had. I normally have more patience with vacs, but the adrenaline and the possibilities of other attacks here in Capital Territory had me short-fused. For all I knew, the attack had delayed me to the point that I'd not be able to get the information I had been sent to collect. The computer disagreed. Since I was only five minutes off capital schedule, everyone knew that the obligatory reading of rights and warrants before any capital interrogation took place would set every substantive thing back a quarter of an hour. It reminded me that even if I went slower than I had on my first attempt at a covert entry like this, I'd still be able to hear 2.35 minutes of legal speak. With that for an incentive, I took my time, sitting back down at the wall. I reached into my mouth and pulled a wisdom tooth loose from the right side of my upper jaw. It didn't hurt, but the spooling out of the fiber optic cable attached to it did kind of tickle. I freed the plug from the crown and snapped the jack into the outlet on the building wall. Linked up, I set the computer to give me an intruder alert if anyone entered the alley. Then I closed my eyes and went in. The fiber optic network inside the building branched from that outlet into a maze because the safe house they were using was located on level three of the Tricelli sector. I knew the interrogation unit would not be on the bottom floor. The building had no basement as the basement of this house would be the penthouse of the building on the Tricelli four. The safest place for the interrogation would be dead center in the house, so that's where I went. Going subreal is usually different for everyone, which makes sense since the world inside computers is a subjective reality. Some subreal systems, like the Cybertronic system, is almost surreal because the entity that owns it is able to impose certain laws and graphic impressions that are too difficult to morph into your own images. A fiber optic network in a stripped building is free of such controlling interests, so my trip through it became exactly what I wanted it to be. In this particular case, I pictured myself swimming otter-like through a golden cylinder. Twisting, I went up, then cut right and left and dove down. I flashed past intersections, then raced along a long right-hand turn and split myself into four parts to cover all four of the outlets in the appropriate room. I left the hard work to the computer. It did it very well. Using IR data from the blocking plates, three in the walls about two feet from the floor, and one overhead near a light fixture, the computer pinpointed the heat sources in the room. Using two suboral sonic pulses from the plates, it mapped the walls, furnishings, and people. It gathered this data, the computer resolved it into a 3D model of the room, and I perched myself on the edge of a desk. The lack of an optical data source meant the people looked as if they had been molded from clay. With the sonic sweep complete, the computer used the blocking plates to pull in sound in the room. The three capital people in the room, two men and one woman, paced around the individual seated in what the computer indicated was a hard metal chair. I dedicated one IR sensor to her and ordered up a fine gradient resolution. I even chanced another sonic pulse and had the computer pull her face together into a very colored landscape. The image it put together felt hauntingly familiar, but was alien enough that I could not place it. Without knowing the color of her shoulder length hair, without being able to see the color of her skin or her eyes, I could not tell if I knew her or had seen a similar picture on a billboard or in some television drama. The computer did indicate a 97% chance, based on gross physical characteristics, 
that the woman was of Northern European descent, but that meant she could have been anything from a blonde Scandinavian to a red-headed Irish woman, or an olive-skinned, dark-haired Spaniard. And that would have been if she were a citizen of Bauhaus. Even if she were from Capital, she could be almost anything the melting pot put together. The legal speak faded away, and the computer increased my oral pickup. Do you understand everything I have said to you? The voice belonged to the more corpulent of the trio in the room. Was that a nod? Did you see her nod? The other two shook their heads. Give it a rest, Campbell. She's catatonic. The woman touched the seated woman on the shoulder. I've got enough psychoactive drugs in her that I think I can get her to talk, but no promises. The third person nodded. Very good, doctor. Mr. Campbell, please leave this to me. Those rights are only important if Mrs. Coven here was undergoing a criminal investigation. We suspect her of nothing. That man stood tall and slender, and the computer colored him a steely gray. Mrs. Coven, you are on Luna and are among friends. I understand you have undergone some traumatic experiences, but they are over now. You are safe. Steele modified his voice, and the computer's digitization of it brought his sincerity through cleanly. It is important, so that this never happens to anyone else, that you tell us what happened to you in Fairview, and after that, can you do that? Campbell pointed at her. I saw a nod. The doctor looked at a box beside me on the table. Her pulse is becoming elevated. I think she did nod. Very well. The steel man reached out and squeezed Coven's shoulder. You are Mrs. Lorraine Coven, and you reside with your husband and two children on Venus in the capital village of Fairview. You lived there all your life. Very recently, something happened there that caused you to leave. Can you describe what happened to me? This time, I saw the nod in the reddish collar that showed up on IR. They came. The doctor reacted as if Campbell had goosed her with a stun stick. This must be a very strong memory. Her pulse is at 130. The IR scan showed heat building up in her muscles as if she were running, but the drugs and restraints prevented her from moving. Steele injected calm into his voice. Mrs. Coven, what you are reliving is a memory. They cannot get you here. They do not know you are here. You are safe. Now, who were they? Black ship. Misshapen. Bulbous. Like the corn when the fungus got into it. Steele's head came up. Mr. Campbell, you will leave the room now. But this is important. If you're going to go to the cartel to protest this action. Now, Mr. Campbell, this will be on your head. I'm going to your supervisor. Now. Campbell nodded to the doctor, then left the room. I punched a piece of myself off to see if the building had a phone crosslink so I could eavesdrop on any call Campbell made, but I set the data gathering on into the background. Steele turned toward the doctor. Recall, doctor, that this patient is full of psychoactive drugs. What she may reveal might only be an impression of the facts colored by her perception and the drugs you have pumped into her. In other words, it is likely subjective, not objective. You would be wise to avoid reporting what you hear to your colleagues. As you wish. Thank you. In your discretion, I trust. Not so, that lawyer. Your trust is well-founded. Now, Mrs. Coven, you said you saw a black ship. What happened? The woman shuddered enough that the computer reported her movement as a jump. They came out of it. Dead things. Metal and flesh. With guns. Pulses at 135. Is that Cybertronic? Steele's features blurred as he shook his head. Unlikely. 
Despite the metal reference, Fairview was closer to Mishima and Imperial than Cybertronic. Rantings, remember, Doctor. Uh, yes, I understand. Mrs. Coven, please continue. Guns, they shot. They shot and shot and shot. Everyone. Her hands turned palm up and her fingers flexed. The blood everywhere. They got past me, shooting, screaming, biting, tearing. Little Nikki, no, Nikki, Nikki. Pulse 210, that's too high for her. I have to sedate. Steele nodded as he crossed his arms. As the doctor worked on the rain coven, Steele paced and approached the table where I sat. Doctor, what would you suggest this patient is speaking about? Horrible trauma to be certain. I have treated post-traumatic stress patients before, and the hallucinogenic portions of her report is outside the standard sort of exaggeration we find in most massacre survivors. Often, we find time dilation and other perception anomalies, but seldom is the image of the perpetrator distorted. If I were forced to guess, I would say that she was abused as a child. It is not usual for such memories to have been suppressed and then return quite virulently and violently later in life, leading to problems that include catatonia. She has created these rending metal and dead flesh things to take the place of the perpetrators. This would lead me to believe that they... Steele turned to look at her. These necromutants? Sure, necromutants if you like are meant to replace her father or uncles or trusted members of her immediate family who abused her. Is her father dead? Was he a metal worker? Quite perceptive of you, doctor. The doctor's cheeks took on a cherry glow as she smiled. I'm glad to be of service. I will see to it that your invoice is paid promptly. You are most kind. The doctor freed Lorraine's arm from a small restraint. She needs a great deal of help, you know. I could treat her. I will relay that suggestion to her people. She has family here on Luna, and they are arranging to take care of her needs. Thank you again, doctor, for your concern. As Steele guided the doctor to the door, I pulled back into my own body and unjacked from the building. I returned my dental work to its correct position and stood up. I saw the dumpster had been hauled away while I had worked on gathering my data. I checked the intrusion log, and the computer had noticed the presence of an Oscar automated trash hauler, but had not alerted me to its presence. Because it worked for Cybertronic, it presented no threat to me. Hence, it did not fulfill the parameters set out in my intruder alert system. I shrugged and headed out of the alley. Had the Oscar remained around, I could have downloaded what I learned into its onboard memory and saved myself a trip to the Ptolemaeus district to report. That would have been appropriate, as I figured what I got was garbage. But if my masters felt it was important enough to gather, who was I to think different? I laughed. At Cybertronic, I was paid precisely because I did think differently. Mutant Chronicles, Fiction, The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy, Volume 3, Dementia, by Michael A. Stackpole. Chapter 1, End.